Well, I hope everybody's well, and I appreciate you being here. And, uh, and of course, everybody surely knows about our announcement last night, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you and answer your questions the best I can. Governor, many Democrats say you could trade them. Uh, will it be a fourth ball with a slap in the face? She said, shame on him, your response. Well, I think that's unfortunate and, and, and surely uh, not justified. I mean, the, rea the reality is just really simple. I ran as a Democrat, and I was really proud of it. And uh, I came here to help, and I came here to get something done. And when it came right to crunch time, the nitty-gritty is real simple. The Democrats walked away from me. I didn't walk away from them. I sat right in their caucus, irregardless of what anybody in the world may say. I sat right in their caucus, 36 people, 36 House members, and I said to them, I said, if you do not vote now in a positive way, there's going to be carnage and there's going to be real people get hurt. And they did. We had the votes. We had the votes on the Senate side, and we had enough votes, our votes, on the, on the House side to pass a budget that would have alleviated all kinds of pain. What happened? They dove in the ditch. They left me high and dry. Then what happened? Then we passed a budget that has all kinds of pain and all kinds of hurt. We walked away from our vets. We walked away from our teachers, our minors. We walked away from absolutely fixing this terrible drug epidemic. We walked away from giving our poorest people rebate checks of $150. We walked away from our seniors and, and being able to exempt the Social Security. We walked away from tourism dollars. We threw it all away, all away. Why? Why did we throw it all away? Because you had Democrats at the crunch time, right at the altar, that didn't like the idea of tax reform, even though it was the smallest component of all, they were willing, they were willing to hurt their absolute constituents, to cut our universities even more, to cut the Women's Commission out, to cut state police, to do all that. They were willing to do that because they didn't like it because it was a Republican idea. That's not going to work with me. It's just not going to work. I can't get, I can't move this state forward continuing to run that same play. Now, it's really unfortunate, but the, but the bottom line is just the truth. The truth is just as simple as just let me just say just this. Do our teachers have a pay raise? Do our poorest people have a rebate check? Are we exempting our veterans' retirement? Do we have a mechanism now to really fix the drug epidemic? Do we have tourism dollars? All those answers are no. Do we have historical tax credits? No. They're all no. Why? We had the votes. We had it done. And my own party left me. Now, I can't keep running this same play, and I won't do it. I want to do something. Yes, sir. Governor, politically speaking, can you go into the definition of the benefit of this move? But as a Democrat, you worked well with the Republican Senate president. and. Sometimes Democrats in the House didn't go along with you. As a Republican, how is any of that going to change? Now you've alienated possibly Democrats. You still have the same people who worked with you last time who may work with you this time. Well, I hope to goodness that, that uh, there are some of the Democrats that will step above this partisan poly, uh, party politics. But on the other hand, I think just this. I really do believe that the Republicans came with an idea, tax reform, 
who in the world here would, would object if the numbers work to being able to get rid of our state income tax at some point in time? Why in the world are we so adverse to that if the numbers work? And I'm, the, I'm a numbers guy. Now, I truly believe that I'll be able to work with the Republicans and go somewhere here. I know if we keep running the play that we ran, and I work my ever-loving tail off, and y'all of you know that. I tried so hard, it was unbelievable. And absolutely, we couldn't get anything done. We got nothing done other than the roads and the education component that we're getting things done that are really going to be able to help our education process. What did we do? If you take away the economic raise or the revenue raise that I put in from the standpoint of the roads and from the standpoint of one other thing that I predicted, and I'm not saying that I'm right by any stretch of the imagination all the time, but I told you severance taxes were going to go up, did I not? And they have. Now, I can tell you just as simple as this. We had an opportunity. I am excited about working with our Republicans as well as the Democrats, but I am extremely excited about working with the Republicans and moving the state forward. The other thing is just this. I have a real relationship with the president of this country. And I really do believe that he'll step forward and try in every way to help West Virginia. I spent, and I didn't disclose this to you, but I spent an hour and a half in the Oval Office with him three weeks ago and left. And I didn't more than just get to my house and they called and wanted me to come back. I was there on, on a Wednesday, and the next Wednesday I was back, and th then I was in the West Wing of the White House for five hours. I met with all kinds of different people. I met with the President two different times that day and everything, and all about two things, an idea on coal and being able to bring jobs, massive jobs, back, and the idea that I presented a long time ago about an environmental subsidy that would be paid, you know, for our contribution of our hardwoods in this state to be able to get hardwood manufacturing, furniture manufacturing, flooring manufacturing, and cabinetry manufacturing right here in our lap in West Virginia. Five hours I was in the West Wing talking about just that. I've got the ear of the White House, and I truly believe that being a Republican will help me there as well. Is there any progress in those initiatives, getting those jobs and manufacturers that you talked to the President about? I, I, I've got to tell you that they're, they're big initiatives. It will take time, you know, and uh, let me explain the coal thing real quick to you. This will take just a second, but I'll do it as best I can. The problem with us losing miners is real simple. And I know this like the back of my hand. The reason we, we lost employment of miners is we lost our market. Now, the regulations made it tougher, but we can, we can ease the regulatory process and we will bring back some mining jobs, but we're surely not going to bring back many mining jobs. The secret to the whole thing is the market. Gas displaced some of our coal, yes, it did. But we, our, our eastern power plants found a way to use western coal and to get it here at a dollar that we can't produce it. Now that's all there is to it. Illinois Basin coal is 25 foot high. Wyoming, the Powder River Basin coals are 60 to 100 foot high. Ours are three foot high. And I'm talking about seams, they're costly to mine. We can't do it. We just can't hardly do it and compete. Now, there's a real problem here, and, and this is the whole thing that I presented. I presented a Homeland Security incentive. Think about this just for a second. What if we someday awaken to the fact that all the eastern coal fields are gone? And if we get another downturn in the market, they could very well be gone. 
Now what if they're gone? You can't just turn on a coal mine and start it back up. Let's say they're gone. And stay with me because I think it's very important that you understand this. If we awaken to the point in time where the eastern coal fields were gone, is our eastern power grid not in jeopardy? And the reason it's in jeopardy is just this. At that point in time, we'd either have to be all gas or we'd have to be gas and western coal. What if a terrorist would put a, an M80, it wouldn't take a giant bomb, at pipeline junctions and that would go off? We'd lose our eastern power grid, wouldn't we? What if we put, had a, a, a terrorist attack on a bridge, a key bridge that was bringing western coal here? We'd lose our power grid. So what I've tried to propose is just this. In order to ensure that we never have a catastrophe beyond belief, I want our president to move forward with the possibility of creating a homeland security incentive for all coal that is purchased that is a central app or northern app coal that is purchased by our eastern power plants. If he were to do that in order to ensure us against a terrible catastrophe that could very well happen someday, it would bring tens and tens and tens of thousands of jobs to Pennsylvania, Ohio, Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Just think about this. We mined 197 million tons of coal in West Virginia at one time. Today we're mining in the low 80s. If you, if you would look at this, we'll say, well, wonder what that would cost. And if it were $15 a ton, 300 million tons of production, 300 million tons that would set absolutely our economies on fire. $4.5 billion a year is just an absolute fraction of the price to pay for security, for protection. Because if we had a disruption of any kind and our eastern coal fields were producing, you can haul the coal to the power plant in a truck. You know, absolutely. It would be, you know, from the standpoint of people that maybe say, well, we don't like coal, you wouldn't have to increase coal as, as, our, as, as for our whole nation. All you would have to do is change the mix to where we were in the mix more than maybe Illinois Basin or more than the Powder River Basin to the eastern power plants. There's a way to do it. It's complicated. It's a big idea. It's a great big idea. But that's what I spent an awful lot of time there about. Yes, sir. Does, does your change political party registration Here's what I told my people, and I told the people in my office here, I told the people in my cabinet just this. I didn't pick them. I've never asked them. I've never asked them if they're a Democrat or Republican or an independent, never. I didn't, I picked the people that I picked because I picked good people, the people that I thought were the best. I don't know what, what registration they are, but here's what I told them. And I told all of them this just today. I said, first of all, I couldn't tell the world what I was going to do, but I, I, I wish I could have told them, but it would have gone all over everywhere. And then we'd have been just answering questions nonstop. You know, I couldn't tell them. And in many ways, I thought it was best not to tell them because if they knew and they didn't tell others, then they would be compromised by saying, well, why didn't you tell us? You know, and so I just didn't tell them. And so, but, but I told them today just this, that I picked them because I thought they were good. If they feel uncomfortable in any way, or they feel like that they can't serve me with all loyalty, and if they feel the least bit uncomfortable, then they need to go. That's all there is to it. 
Is there anyone left? I mean, there's some very prominent people from your administration that aren't here right now. Has anybody tendered their resignation already? Nobody's brought a resignation to me. No, sir. Did the president specifically ask you to change parties? No, no. That was my idea to the president. You know, yes. I noticed you were going off a pair of remarks last night. Who wrote those? I did. You wrote them yourself? I, wrote, I, I could, in fact, wherever Pam is, Pam, go get them. You know, I, you know, it's really ironic, but I'll show them to you, you know. Yes, sir. Governor, what kind of commitments did you get from the White House on these two initiatives? Say one more time. What kind of commitments did you get from the White House on two initiatives? Well, what they've done is that the, they've really listened. I mean, you know, I don't have either, I don't have a commitment on either one that says we're going to do this and everything. I have a commitment that they will absolutely take them into very serious consideration. And, and just the other day, you know, uh, I can't recall a couple of days ago and everything, but uh, I had an extensive conversation with Rick Perry as well. I've, I've talked to, to everybody. Everybody gets it. Everybody tries to, is trying to digest how to do it. You know, I'm sure we could we could end up tweaking in a lot of different ways, but at least we have a real idea for real employment in front of the White House. These were my notes. You know, I wrote them. You can see that. <laughs> you know, this is, is exactly what I spoke from. Those two pages. I mean, that's it. Did you feel like their follow-up was? No, not necessarily at all. You know, in, in the conversations at the White House and everything, you know, we, first of all, I, I'm, you know, I know the Trump family. I've been with these kids a whole bunch. You know, I've been with these kids more than I've been with Donald, you know, and everything. But, but like I said, Eric and I were together, and Eric was underneath my car changing a tire way back in the middle of the woods where I hit a rock and blew the tire out. And uh, Don Jr. and I have hunted together. We fished together. You know, uh, I've been with Ivanka in, in the White House and everything, and she's terrific and everything. So I know them. I know them. And, and I can pick up the phone and call them, and I think they'll at least consider maybe an idea. From this standpoint and everything, I, I, I feel, I mean, the only other thing I could add is, is I was with the president when he landed in, in Beckley. He was getting, he was getting off the, the plane, and I looked at his lapel, and right here on his lapel, he had this spot. And I had this in my, in my stuff that I was going to say last night, but there's too much stuff, and I, I didn't get to it. But he had a spot, and he got in the car with me, or in, in, I got in the car with him, you know, a limo with him, and he said, he said, look at this spot on my coat and everything. And, 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 and we kind of laughed about it and everything. And he said, I was leaning up against a reporter or something like that, and they had a red magic marker and it got on my coat. And I thought to myself, I do that every other day. You know, but, uh, and then we just kind of laughed and everything. But going down the road, he said, you know, people were waving and everything. And he said, you know, he said, uh, it's not very often that I'm in, I, I'm riding down the road, just, you know, you and myself, you know, with a Democrat uh, governor. And so, so, uh, but anyway, I do think, I do think I'm really excited about the opportunity to, for us to work together. And I think, I think we'll bring some good stuff to West Virginia. A couple of questions, Governor. Uh, one, did you talk with Joe Manchin before you made your decision? And if you did, can you relate that? If you haven't, uh, what do you think of his reaction? And two, is your move more of a statement to the Republican Party in West Virginia or the Democratic Party in West Virginia? I think, let me ask you the, end, the tail end of the question first. I think the process that I went through, now you got to remember, I've run a lot of companies, I've been with a lot of people, I've done a lot of stuff, I've got a lot of white hair, I've made a lot of mistakes. I really think that, that if you could see, you know, it's, it's not a matter of that I think the Republican Party is great or the Democrat Party is bad or the Democrat Party is great or the Republican Party is bad. It's just simply this. The people that are in office, those 36 people, 
dropped the ball. And I don't have any confidence that I'm going to be able to get those 36 people to not drop the ball and stay super united and everything if I were to remain a Democrat. I can't move us to where we need to move because I think there's 36 people that drop the ball. Now, as far as your question, Kenny, about Joe Manchin, I did talk to Joe the day before. I really wanted to talk to Joe a good bit before because I've got a tremendous respect for Senator Manchin. And, uh, you know, so the long and the short of it is we did talk. Joe, Joe said, you know, on one hand, you know, I'm disappointed, but I understand you wanting to move the state forward and you're trying in every way you possibly can. And he said, uh, good friends will just disagree sometimes. And, and on this one, maybe we just disagree. Governor, parties exist because of shared values. What would you say, how would you describe Republican values? What are they? You know, I would hope that they're really good, you know, and, and I would hope with the Democrats that they're really good. But the net net of the whole thing is just this, is Jim isn't changing. Jim is still going to be Jim. Jim is still going to be the person that stands up with all in him for the common everyday family. That's all there is to it. Jim's going to be rock solid behind the teachers and trying to help education. Jim is going to be exactly the same Jim that always was there. I'm just telling you with the process of what we have in this great building, Jim can't help West Virginia the way it is today. And Jim is not going to come down here and just take pictures and kiss babies and be and hang out. Jim's not doing that. Jim came here to get something done for West Virginia and get us away from being dead last and 50th and everything coming or going. And Jim has an opportunity to do that today, especially with the president and especially with all the things that we have to offer within this state. And that's what I'm going to do. Governor, have you spoken to Conrad Lucas about change? I mean, he said he's never spared any cruel words toward you. I have not. I have not. In fact, if Conrad was sitting right here, I don't know that I would know Conrad. And so I have not spoken with him. Governor, I'm reminded of the plan that you preferred the House Republicans knock down several times through the course of the legislative session and the special session. And at one point, stood united in front of the House in their opposition to the plan. Do you think that you're going to be able to work with those folks as a team? I surely think so. You see, through this whole process, in the beginning, I would have thought that uh, Speaker Armstead was just dug in and so rigid it was unbelievable. I'll never forget him standing right in my office and saying, when we agreed to a 6.35, you know, sales tax. Now just think about it. Everybody, everybody said, you know, Justice proposed all, proposed all these tax increases, but at the end of the day, Justice's tax increases were very, very minuscule. Justice's tax reductions were pretty dead gum significant. And we could have pulled it off. We could have pulled it all off and basically had a net tax reduction to most everybody. In fact, to everybody. You know, but, but Speaker Armstead sat in my office and said this. He said, if you would have told me is very, if you would have told me a year ago that I would be out trying to promote an increase in the consumer sales tax of 6.35, I'd have said, you're crazy. But he was. He was. He was trying. He was really trying. And Mitch Carmichael always tried. Just think about this. They started out trying to do tax reform and a 20% reduction with no triggering. And then it went from 20 to 12.8, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9, 12.9,
then it went to 776, and then it went to 5555 with triggering. Then it went from the, uh, the, the, all of the tax benefit was going to the lower and middle income tax brackets. You think of the compromise level that they came with and they should be commended. So I'm really anxious to work with them and I think I can. You're a math guy and a numbers guy. How does the minority party take the blame for defeating legislation? The minority party could sit back and say, well, we're in the minority. We didn't, well, I mean, what can we do? We didn't do anything, but I told you exactly what they did. Exactly. My point is just this. I'm not willing to go back through the same process again. I'm not willing to sit countless hours with the Senate, with Mitch Carmichael and, and Speaker Armstead and finally get enough support on that side and then go over to the Dem side when everything that we were doing would have benefited the constituents of the Dem and have them just dive in the ditch. I'm not willing to continue to do that process because the net net of what we did was accomplish nothing and hurt a lot of people. What if you, let me just ask you one question and ask you if, if you can live with this. If you can live with this, I can't. What if it, your family, what if tonight your family's called and you've got a daughter and that daughter is at the hospital and we've lost her because of a drug overdose and we could have helped her. What if you're the family out there that, that, that's living on an income of $10,000 and they're paying a little bit more for gas, they're paying a little bit more for DMV fees and you could have written them a check for $150 on a rebate check and you didn't do it and you're hurting them. What if you got a kid that's going to WVU and now we've raised the, the tuition so high that you can't afford to send them? Are you willing to do that? I'm not. I'm not willing to sit here and say, look what we did in the roads and look what we did in education. I'm not willing to forget about those people. And those people mean something to me. And I'm going to make it right. I'm going to get something done. As long as God gives me breath, that's what I'm going to do. Governor, there's a core group of Republicans who are, for a better word, anti-tax. The, 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 the caucus that, that coalesced against your proposals, which necessitated the need of some Democrats to cross over to get it passed. Now that you're a member of their party, how are you going to reach out to that group? Well, I'm going to reach out in every way possible, but Kenny, the, the, the secret here is not, you know, just passing a tax increase. That's never been the secret. The secret to everything is just this, is you've got a, you had a $500 million hole in the bucket and you had to do something to fix the $500 million hole in the bucket. Now what we've done is going to fix a lot of hole in, hole in the bucket and that is just the fact that our roads initiative is going to bring so much opportunity and revenue that it's, it's off the chart. And we surely, to goodness, cannot mess up no matter what in the world anybody may think, love, hate, or whatever, they, 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 how they feel about the legislature, they feel about me, they feel about anything, we've got to pass that going away. It will bring so much revenue to our state, it's unbelievable. But not only that, our severance income is going to rock the world in the, in the near term. Don't know that it can do it forever, but it will rock the world in the near term. So it's just a matter of the numbers. You know, I mean, I'm, I, like I said, I'm, it doesn't, we do not need to portray this in any way that we need a tax increase. We just need the numbers to work. We need the revenue coming from somewhere. Well, we got severance revenue coming. We've got roads revenue coming. And maybe we don't need a taxing. We maybe just need to work and dial into tax reform. You know, so, but there's opportunity. Governor, are you still thinking of calling your legislature back on this question? I am. I am. You know, uh, I, you know, we've we got to let the dust settle here just a little bit. But, uh, but I want to call them back in, and I want to call them back in immediately, and I want to revisit two things. 
and that is surely to the Lord above. We can pass this 5% successful bidder's fee on all of our road work, which the contractors were behind a thousand percent to bucket the money and fix this terrible drug epidemic. We have got to do that. I mean, for crying out loud, why we threw that away, who on this planet would ever know? You know, I mean, it's as simple as this. If you get a, the bid, the successful bid on a road job and the bid's $10 million, you're able, if you want, to put that 5% on the bottom of your bid. But I'll promise you what they'll do. I'll promise you what you'll, you'll do is you'll look at your bid and you'll say, huh, I've got 10 million, I had 5%, I'm 10.5 million. So, but I don't think I'll get to bid if I submit 10.5. And you go back and you whittle a little bit out of labor and parts and fuel and everything and you change your bid to 9.95 and you submit that and you're the successful bidder and you still have to pay the five percent into the bucket so the state gets the job gets the five percent to fix a drug epidemic surely for not five percent maybe even for nothing you know but we've got then $150 million to do social workers, law enforcement, treatment facilities, everything that our people badly, badly need. Now, that's one thing. And the second thing I'd put on the call is just this. Some way, somehow, we've got to exempt our vets retirement. And that's it. That's the end of the call. You know, that's it. Sir, do you have any indication that your new Republican teammates are interested in the 5% fee? I, I see no reason whatsoever that they wouldn't be because the contractors, the people that are basically paying the fee, they were all on board, you know, because of the enormous amount of work that, we're, we're, that they're going to get which they have, which they've starved for forevermore. The Speaker Arms has already said he thinks it might be unconstitutional. His reading of the statute says any money raised for roads has to be put into the road fund. It can't go elsewhere. Well, I can't answer that. That's parliamentary. That's that's beyond my pay grade. I've got. To, I'll have to have some legal advice on that. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Sir, there are there are several things still on the agenda of your administration, for example, making sure flood relief happens, cooperating with the federal government on sure. the, um, the audit situation, both determining what happened to miss these three audits and making sure that deadlines are not missed in the future. Right. Uh, I'm looking ahead, but if you were to lose several members of your administration all at once, could those things be carried through efficiently? Well, let's just say this. First and foremost, uh, you know, the train always seems to go on. At the point in time when we really believe that by losing a few key members, or really by losing the engineer, me, the train always goes on. And what we just gotta do is sometimes it becomes a little difficult. My dad used to say all the time, son, just stick your hand in a bucket of water and don't move it. And then jerk it out of the water real quick and watch the water. The water will be turbulent for just a little bit, but just stand there and watch it, and eventually it'll level right back out. I'm telling you, this train's going to go on, and this train's going north. You know, I'm a basketball coach, and I always tell our kids just the same thing. If you throw the ball east and west, you best better make sure that that pass is caught. But if you throw the pass down the floor, and you throw it away, you'll never hear anything from me. I want us going down the floor. I can't stand us going to east to west. We got to go down the floor. Governor, is there any chance to join the Trump administration? Would I join the Trump administration? No, sir. No, sir. And the reason for that is, look, I've said it a thousand times. I love West Virginia more than good sense. I absolutely love West Virginia. I have no ambition in the world of leaving our state in any way, shape, form, or fashion. 
I just want goodness for right here. Governor, back to the audit subject. When the chief of staff was here and talked about it with us uh, earlier this week, he said that he expected the investigation to go on for another 10 days or so. You had previously said that heads will roll. So if you find out who's responsible for 80 to 90 percent of the state agencies not making their audits in time, do you plan to offer some type of punishment that would go up to and include firing? Absolutely. Absolutely. In all honesty, it's a disgrace. It's what's happened. It's a total disgrace. I mean, we're going to have a lot of embarrassment. We already have had. We're going to have uh, inconvenience. We're going to have, it's going to cost money. It's just, you know, for a state that is struggling like we're struggling, the magnitude of the money is going to be significant and absolutely it's inexcusable. It's inexcusable. It's all there is to it. People got to do their job. I'm a person that says whomever's accountable, if they've messed it up and, they, and, and there is, it is unequivocally, you know, someone's fault and everything, they got to go. You just got to go. It's all there is to it. Governor, I assume we're about to wrap up here. Is your intention to go down to Secretary Warner's office and change your res registration and are we allowed to videotape that? You can videotape it. I'm going right now. Okay, thank y'all.